So the problem statement that we have in our hand today is about how can you perform customer segmentation in an online retail kind of a space? Quite often you'll see that, you know, you'll, you will come across this kind of a problem statements where you have been given some kind of transactional data set for say some kind of major customers. Uh, and these are transactions which are occurring between some timestamp between, I guess, a period of first of uh, December to 9th September, oh, sorry, 9th of December, 2011, you have a years of data for a UK based, uh, online, uh, non-store kind of a retail company. And the company is majorly dealing into selling unique, uh, all occasion gifts. And there are many customers of the company who are wholesalers. So there are all kinds of users, I guess, probably some kind of users who are wholesalers. There are some users who might be retail guys. It's an online store. So as a company, it's, it's good for them to probably do this kind of a segmentation. I'll actually come to that point a little bit in a, in a time. I just want to check like, you know, if you guys are all settled in with the notebook loaded and you have the data and everything all sorted. So, so, so we can then actually start with our discussions here. Okay. Maybe I'll just wait for like two more minutes. So for peeps who have just joined, all I want you to uh, do is very quickly load the data and uh, it's a guided project. So, and quickly check if you are able to load the data, see the head and the shape and at least start reading for the others, the context of the problem statement. And the very first question that I want you to answer is think about why would a company like this, why would the company be interested in doing this segmentation? What is the benefit that they're going to der derive out of it? Doing in the analysis, that's fine. But what do you think would be the business objective of doing this kind of a retail customer segmentation where we are talking about a UK company, which is an all online store retail deals into occasion, all occasion gifts, uh, majorly in UK, you have transactions around for like one year. Some of your customers are wholesalers. Some of the customers are your retailers. So now think of the points where even before you start with the analysis, why would someone be interested to do customer segmentation here? Hey, Hardik. Yes, yes, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to like uh, introduce an case study of India here so that we could re relevant relate it. Mm -hmm. So in India, uh, we have Peter England, right? So Peter England have three types of stores. One is their blue store and one is their red store. So in red store is in uh, like town three cities mm -hmm. where the purchasing parity of customers is uh, like very less and they have their, their budget uh, oriented uh, goods. Like mm -hmm. their t-shirts will be of some kind of range only there. And mm -hmm. if you visit their blue store, so the blue store has a variety of uh, ranges there, like uh, some shirt will range uh, to a multiple of uh, thousands. And mm -hmm. in case of red store, that is not the case. So it, I mean to say that they cluster their customers according to their purchasing power. Mm -hmm. And then what do they do with that? Because they wanted to target customers well. Mm -hmm. That's why they segment their customers. Okay. So basically I think Jayant is also pointing out that it can be useful for targeting. So if I know that what is a kind of a customer that I have, I can use him for targeting. What kind of targeting you are talking about here? Can you elaborate? Any idea what kind of a targeting we can do? So say like, I, I, right. okay. uh, like I said that uh, in town three cities, the budget of people is not so more. So they will target to their budget oriented uh, goods to that cities. And in large cities, the purchasing power of customer is more. So 
they will showcase their high range products there okay so basically you are saying that i can target based on their purchase power okay what else what else any other thoughts see guys the... also according to their likes and dislikes you can also target okay according to their likes and dislikes so how how do you think you can figure that out you are an online store who might be having so many products how do you how do you do this kind of uh, liking and disliking so yeah you you are speaking the truth that it's important to know their likes and dis dislikes but then will target will will customer segmentation be required in that kind of a case so what you are hinting at is probably towards another topic which is called as recommendation very very re related topic it's something that we are going to talk about uh, uh i mean it's in the part of your curriculum in the next week's discussion uh but so say for example if you are someone who who likes a lot of toys okay so it's like i need to personalize my targeting to recommend anyone who likes toys with a new set of range of toys or maybe some similar toys are probably you have captured but that's more to do with recommendation which is one to one why segmentation here why are we doing segmentation any any ideas guys maybe based on their budget we can source the project uh yeah we can source some products mm, maybe based on their budgets we can source the projects see the entire idea about this segmentation what probably i feel here is majorly to know firstly who the customers are who the customers are with respect to how much they purchase how much they purchase when they purchase and what is their frequency of return like overall i have wholesalers overall i have say retailers is the frequency and the amount of wholesalers people who are purchasing are there also particular segments in this wholesale or are there also particular segments in this retail with respect to how much these customers are actually purchasing how frequently do they purchase when do they purchase and every time when they come back what is the what is the power of which they are actually purchasing now what this allows me to do is basically if sometime i see that you know there is a frequent customer that is probably going to come on to my platform again and again i can think of some kind of a loyalty program here if there's a one off kind of a customer who is demanding a huge percentage of discount in the name of retail in the name of a wholesaler probably he is not the right set of customer for you to target you might then also go ahead and see that people who are actually your wholesale customers who are very very frequent within which the kind of products they actually buy is very limited to the top 10 it also helps you to do what is called as capacity planning and i know that hey this is a segment which regularly comes purchases with a high frequency and also has a higher budget and more often than not these are the set of guys who stock 10 products are basically these kind of things it will allow me to do forecasting agle mahine this is a cohort which could be a big chunk of your customer base is definitely going to come back to you i can plan in advance okay and what happens is you can also set up some kind of relationship managers here see guys always remember the rule of 80 20 in any business it's the 20% of your workforce which brings about 80% of the revenue mota mota you know in in real life so what happens is you if you identify that there is a certain set of customer which is your actual mula which is actually your cash cows you would want to build more and more relationships with that set of customers right because in any particular month or a particular date time they fail to put the order it could be a big dent on your business right so you would really want to build these kind of relationships and see you never lose out on this chunk of your customers 
to your competitors right so i hope guys you are understanding that there is a whole set of advantage that this kind of an online retail store uh, has when it performs customer segmentation basically to know who the customers are like you know what is the frequency of their purchases how what are the different set of customers do they come when is a particular month you can probably see that probably the traffic can go up or down so there are a lot of advantages by which you can uh, identify when you're doing a customer segmentation kind of an activity so someone is also pointing out basically knowing the customer with purchasing power range and frequency with the help of this information seller can maximize their sale perfectly correct so here it was an another example now this is a cohort which is very infrequent with me uh and they are asking that you know we are a wholesaler they are asking a discount as high as what your frequent guys are going to ask for so you'll notice that these are not the best set of customers so discounting them once is actually going to put a dent on your business again maybe they are not the right set of customers so until they move from this segment to this segment do not start to offer the premium services which your regular guys are already getting right so a lot of strategies can be built on top of this once you know that you know what kind of customers do you have in your database here cool so i think with that simple analysis or simple understanding uh, now let's go actually towards solving this kind of a problem so i think you have been given data across invoice number so some kind of an invoice it's a six digit integral number uniquely assigned to each transaction uh, so these are different different transactions which people might be doing the product that they buy the description of the product how many quantities are which they are buying when did they buy what was the price that they bought what was the customer id and the country from which uh, the customer is making the purchase so where each customer resides so this is the information that you have the invoice code the product item that they bought the description of the product the quantity of each product which was bought uh what was the invoice date and time so invoice number invoice date and time when did they buy the product uh what was the unit price and who bought it from which country fair enough okay so i think people who joined late uh guys just quickly check if everyone here has their notebooks with you because you are the one who's going to drive this project right now um you know i want you to code first before we actually even start to discuss so quickly check guys if all of you have loaded your notebook and have the data set loaded and you have like around 5 lakh 5.4 lakh records spread across eight columns okay is there anyone who has not loaded the data set so or else i'll go ahead then or do you want me to wait Okay, let's get going then. So, quickly check what is the information that dot info is giving you. Uh, any discrepancies which you guys can find? Anything abnormal? There are null values in the customer ID. Yeah, so there are null values in the customer ID column. There are null values. Description in, also. Description also. And anything to do with the data types? invoice number is object so invoice number is object but that's fine right invoice number is an object it's even even though it's not an object or even if this would have been an integer is still not really going to be worried about the invoice number right because yeah. you see this kind of a data is probably it, it's a row level transactions so it's just a unique identifier that you know this particular transaction had a invoice number like this or particular set of transactions so it's like in totality this was a transaction in which customer 17850 bought i guess each of these products uh, so many quantity yeah now where do you get the data set from i think when you would have started this view guided project there is a data set available here itself okay 
So now there is some null value which is present. And uh, what we are going to do is now you tell me, guys, do you think you can encode customer IDs? Can you impute the missing values which you found in customer ID column? No. No, it's not possible, right? It's not possible. It's not even right thing to do because customer ID is nothing but like a unique identifier for each of the customers that we have a role number kind of a thing. So what we are going to do here is simply just drop the missing values. I think, which I think is not going to be much of a loss because although you will be losing out on 1.4 L like kind of data set, uh, but it's information is simply saying that you really do not have information about those customers. So it does not even really make sense as well. Okay. Maybe I'll just load my data again. Yeah. So I'm left with some data set. What is wrong here? Just give me a moment, right? Did you change the path according to your uh, drive? No, no, I have done everything. It's still asking me to do it right now was a little weird. Okay, let's see now. Taking some time to load. I'll just wait for like a minute. It took around 44 seconds to load one. Uh, it should not take really that much of time. <laughs> it's not that big of a data set, also. It's just barely 0.5 million records. It was taking in mine also. Maybe probably it is in Excel format. That is the. A... Actually, I had ran this thing before as well. It uh, ran very quick. Okay, never mind. So we'll just run this thing here. Okay. So I'm left with some four lakh odd customers right now. Okay. So now moving ahead. So. Okay, now the next thing which we are going to do is after the removing of the null, we are left with some four or four lakh odd records. Okay, so now let's look at invoice number here. Okay, so we have invoice numbers here. So the first thing which we can do is probably, uh, you know, so this probably is trying to tell you that there are certain invoices. Uh, in your data, which might have contained the letter C. Okay. Now, how did we come to know here? Probably one of the hint here, which I think uh, someone also pointed out was invoice number was object. And what you could have done is you could have also gone ahead and done, say some kind of a value count on it to just check if there is any discrepancy, which you're finding in value counts. So here, probably they have already given to you that there are some uh invoices which do contain the letter c so actually before even running that let's see we can print those rows where the invoice number contains the letter capital c so there are certain invoices which are beginning with the letter c here so probably these are not the best of the customers because uh sorry these are not the best of your transactions because they are talking about some kind of a refund which might have been initiated right so you see the quantity is all negative here. Uh, it's maybe because uh, 
the you know once you purchase the customer might have come to return the item to you now although this information was something you know that we could not figure out so easily probably this is something which you might have also come to know as a business domain knowledge so while you might have imported this kind of a data you might be aware that you know there could be returns in your data set who particularly can be identified with the identifier c at the beginning so all we are doing right now is just removing those uh, rows for us so if we do that we can just drop the rows and probably after that i'll also do a dot shape here which i think is done in the next step if we drop uh, c suppose for example c53639 then we have to also drop uh, the order placed also right 53691 huh. no so not necessary so think of like this initially whenever the customer might have done before the cancellation so c is standing for cancellation here there was some intent to actually make a purchase uh, the customer had the purchasing power to make that kind of a purchase and then later on probably for some reasons unknown to us right now uh, did return the product also to us so yes there could be a possibility that you could actually even remove the entire order itself however right now it's okay to keep them as because we are trying to identify that hey this kind of a customer at least had the intent or the purchasing power to make this kind of a transaction in first place so that was the probably the intention with which we are not removing the original purchase and the only the cancellation that has happened okay, okay. does that make sense yeah see the entire idea about doing this kind of an analysis is to know your customers in this i at least get to know something about the customer id 175 over it that you know what he at some point of time although he cancelled was really interested in this kind of a product he was really interested in this kind of a product was really interested in this kind of a product to more so we don't know here from the data set that what could be the reason why did he return it okay but at least it becomes a, some kind of a data point for us to future target even this kind of a customer that hey at some point of time you actually had this kind of a purchase we know now what is the power of this kind of a purchase the customer can make and uh, the kind of different projects also uh, purchase is also the products that the customer have bought it gives a lot of information cool now i ran the shape i can even run the describe so from the entire data set i have only few columns which are actually numerics which are quantity unit price and customer id customer id again is a unique identifier does not make a lot of sense so what do i see here i i have the description about the quantity column and i have the description about the unit price column so tell me one thing guys from the quantity column uh, do you do you see anything and do you see anything from the unit price any comment here which you find particularly let's talk about the unit price column do you see something which is uh which is like anything from this description here Like up to seventy percent, seventy five percentile maximum is maximum value. Yeah. Too so much. Here, yeah. So here you see, and most of the products from this shop that people are purchasing are not that very expensive, except for few of the items which are bomb of a money, right? So you know, most of the products which probably this this uh, store is also hosting. is not that of an expensive item what about the quantity on an average you see uh, people who purchase are kind of like purchasing in the order between 2 to 12 so on an average any product that they are buying for uh, can lie between a range of 2 to 12 anything which is like this huge size is an exceptional or an outlier kind of an outlier uh, order here okay so i think this gives a fair amount of indication now what we're going to do next is probably 
we can go ahead and even do some kind of an EDA here. Okay. So let's see what is the EDA thing that we can do here. So first of all, what I've done is I have taken the description and I have ran a value counts on top of it. Okay. And let me see the different columns that I have, the different products, which I have both. So look at this. I have around white hanging hard tea light holder, 2000 of them. And I have Regency cake stand three tier 1700 of them. And I have party bunting 1300 of them. What do you think? Uh, what do you think about these, these products here? So what exactly are we doing from the value counts when I'm doing on descri describe on the data set that I have? Counting the number of products sold. Yeah. So basically whenever every row, every row in my data set is talking about what a particular transaction within which a particular product was sold for a particular quantity. Now, what I've done is I've done a value counts on this particular column. If more the number of rows starts to show me a particular description, what can I infer out of it? What can I infer about these five products? And what can I infer about these five products? The top are mostly mostly interesting. Yeah, go ahead. One at a time guys. Yeah, you can say, you can speak, sorry. Yeah, so we can say the top ones are most sold products. Sorry? The top uh, five ones are the most sold products. Correct. So basically, these are your top selling products. These are your top selling products. So above are top selling products. Uh, we can say all products are not sold equally. Correct. So all products are also not sold equally. And in the bottom, so here, uh, you know, one thing that we have still missed out is for each of the product. Also, this is basically the number of items, how, how frequently they have occur occurred, but we have still not accounted for their quantity. Now, this is basically most famous type of items, but you might've seen it can differ also from the type of quantity, which people are purchasing. See, it may happen like this. Everyone who comes to make a purchase ends up buying the Regency cake stand three tire. However, every second customer who comes to buy this item buys three of them instead of buying only one of this kind of an item. So from a popularity kind of an item, this might be really popular. However, from a most selling item perspective, there could be another item also. Okay. So here right now we have just taken into consideration kind of a popularity by just looking at the number of rows, which contain this kind of a description, we could similarly also do when we add a group by of the description and do a sum of what the quantity price. So can you very quickly also, uh, just check that by grouping of the description, are these top, top five products, uh, even popular from the quantity perspective? Can, can you guys just code that thing for me and see? Yeah. So you understood what we are talking about here. Basically, these are just nothing but the different rows, which are most popular. Are they even popular from a quantity perspective is what I'm asking you to do. So can you do like a group by on the description and do an aggregation of the sum on the quantity field and compare, do the quantity also matches with the top five products, which is being displayed here. So if I have to quickly do it myself also here, by the time you guys do it, so I can do a dot description and I can do quantity dot sum. Dot sort underscore values sending equal to false. Let's just pick up the top five of them. So let's see. Hmm. So look at this. 
products having high and low sell okay uh done with this thing guys so look at the difference here so although these products are very famous from a description perspective that every probably out of uh, so many customers visiting to you uh, uh, around 2000 customers actually went ahead to make a purchase for this kind of an item however from a quantity perspective it's not the same so from a quantity perspective none of i guess from the top 5 is present in here except for this guy i guess jumbo bag red uh, white uh, hanging is also like the last one p yeah so two products to p and uh, this guy they are popular and they are popular by demand also so by actual quantity by demand is the product which is very famous although this paper craft little buddy guy uh, had a good quantity of sale but it's not probably the best when it comes to popularity perspective so you know you can also keep these things in mind cool so these are the top 5 products and we can also visualize this kind of a thing okay so the top 5 products based on maximum selling are so white hanging heart regency jumbo bag party bunting and your lunch bag red retro sport okay clear guys so these based on maximum selling or based on the frequency sorry okay can you repeat your question again please uh, come top five list please show again the top five list mm-hmm. not this one sir yes yeah, the visualization just below this okay uh, the, these are the maximum frequency no yeah these are maximum frequency yes so maximum selling we can rename this by frequency Uh, hardik i have a doubt yeah so if a product is not popular and uh, if it it was sold for a large quantity then wouldn't it account as a outlier like it doesn't it doesn't sell very often but once in a while it got sold in a very large quantity correct yeah so that kind of a product might actually also qualify to be as a as an outlier so probably the the uh the product was not very uh, frequently purchased but then whenever someone came to purchase it uh, bought it in like bulk quantities so those so, can be seasonals could be seasonals also could be seasonals also right like on christmas be, correct could be seasonal also so say for example think of like uh, leather jackets or maybe uh, anything to do with winter items right gloves i'm sure you will not buy this kind of an item every sunday to sunday however maybe once in a while you will actually go and make a purchase okay think of like uh, umbrellas as well you know it's a very seasonal item but then whenever you are going to buy it probably depending upon how what kind of a wholesaler you are you might actually buy it in a bulk right so totally depends upon whether the item is you know being bought in a seasonal kind of an item compared with something which is uh more easily to sell and it's actually per, uh, available across all the seasons as well so something which has non seasonal dependency you'll notice that gets actually sold on a more frequent basis as compared to something product which could be very very seasonal does that help hush yeah okay so let's go ahead now the next thing which we are going to look at is so i have the different stock codes for each of the products so i'll just quickly also do like a df dot head here so that we have the idea about what is the data set that we have so i think your stock code basically what it means so going back to the data set stock code is nothing but the product item code okay so every product will have a unique item code assigned to them basically that's the stock code if i'm doing a value counts on it 
okay so if i do a value count i get the stock code of the respective products basically what we did above only right so i'm just doing again the same thing but this time instead of doing description i'm doing a stock code right so do you think these values and their respective products are going to be any different than what we did above and they'll be the same thing right so either you do it by the stock code or you do it by the description you're not really going to make a difference can someone very quickly check how can i check whether every product which i have has only one description and vice versa also that every description is only given to one single product what i'm trying to ask you to do is can you quickly check if there is one to one mapping between the product item code and the respective description that we have or are there certain descriptions which are given the same description to two different products can you quickly check that for me and confirm if this kind of a one to one mapping is true or is there any thing which is fishy in the data set so how will you do that how will you check this one to one correspondence the first basic check we can check any unique something sorry the first basic check we can do uh, n unique okay how will you do the n unique on what you will do the n unique on both the columns okay or we can uh, group by on first uh, description and second on uh, stock code okay so here probably what you can do is you can do a, as bharat was also rightly pointed out so i have done a group by on stock code now for description i can do what dot n unique now if i have any stock code where the number of descriptions which i am getting is more than one that means there is a product which has more than one description so let's see what value do we get mm, n unique ka spelling i think i have made a mistake n unique and not like this i mean any uh, I think... no what's what's the mistake here this is also right right so here what i've done is for every stock code i have gone and checked that how many descriptions exist for each of the product items that i have okay i was saying like we can do it like uh, differently for each column that would uh, uh... yeah so you'll have to do this one also and you'll have to do this one also so you'll take stock code here that now each description does it have multiple stock codes associated with it probably which will not be the case so every description is assigned only one stock code so that means this kind of a value count which have we have got again is exactly the same that we what we saw above guys everyone understood these two lines of coding that we did it was just to check uh, the hey, hardik every stock code with a description the yes. length was different when you run two cells independently okay what was the length difference 200 that's fine na see because if this was starting with one and ending with one all of the values are going to be sorted okay you are seeing duplications kya yeah uh, by using sort values uh, i found some with more than one values also what did you found uh, like oh like, so there are yeah. some stock codes which have more than one description and we will quickly check for these guys also there are descriptions which are associated with more than one stock code also okay so now what do you think of this kind of a data guys where one stock code has more than one description and a particular description is spread across more than one stock codes what do you think of this kind of a data then this is a classic example of noise in your data tell me one thing guys you have a product which is an item 
does it make sense to have multiple descriptions of the same item from a catalog perspective every e-commerce will have this one thing called as catalog okay where it will be like okay i have a particular product id with a particular description now this is a classic example where a particular product one has one item here description another item description here so you have duplicated your description which your item has this kind of a data from what it looks like right now is noise in your data set it should not have happened every product item should have had one single description and a particular description should have been very unique to each of the stock pool yeah are you i i hope guys everyone is getting a sense of why this kind of a data is uh, showing us to be containing some noise any any questions anyone has here so do we have to remove it no right now we are not going to do anything with it we are we're going to live with this kind of a description and the data that we have but i'm trying to like at least you know bring awareness to you that uh, from a from a from even a common sense perspective it would not be advisable for every item to have multiple descriptions and for the same description to be associated with multiple products like think like think of like this so dosa is like probably an item right it might have if it starts to have multiple descriptions you are getting confused in the particular dosa that you have similarly if a particular description you cannot give it same to say the two food items maybe those and other could be in idli right so you are going to mess up your entire data set might not really make a difference but of course it does not make sense so you should be careful cool so we will have some kind of a distri distribution across the stock codes uh, from a frequency perspective and similarly just like how we got it for quantity perspective as well you could also go ahead and check from a quantity perspective also how each of the stock codes are behaving there should not be really much of a deviation like i'm assuming that these are not too many values which have multiple descriptions and multiple stock codes uh there there should not be really much of a difference uh in the top 5 results that you have uh with the top 5 results that we have got above how do you think you can map this stock code name with the respective descriptions what you can do here probably you can just do stock code com comma does this description only so you'll get along with that stock code name you'll also get the description that would have been the simplest way to get the value yeah cool so i think that was fair so let me just now go ahead a little and get the top stock codes and the bottom stock codes okay yeah so one of the ways by which you could have dealt with is probably you will have to investigate that what is the reason why a particular stock code is having multiple descriptions this might also involve deletion of certain product okay so you'll have to actually go and speak to the guy who maintains a catalog that firstly is there a possibility for any particular item to contain multiple descriptions and if yes what is that scenario so you'll have to understand the scenario within which this kind of a mapping might must have happened and then accordingly take a decision that yes if there's a mistake it's a genuine mistake you'll have to remove it otherwise uh, you'll have to try to understand the reasoning why there was multiple product tagging which ha has happened okay so a little difficult to comment whether we should remove or not you'll have to really get an understanding of the context in which this kind of an action has happened yeah cool can you also do a check across the country so how many countries do we have so it looks like we have some 36 countries uh but since it's a uk based platform most of the people who have come to purchase are residing within uk itself okay and some of the neighboring countries of uk particularly maybe say germany france spain so some of the european countries here and very few from the other countries like lithuania brazil shay republic and 
Bahrain. Okay, so we can even go and plot the famous countries which have come for the purchase. So we see that the most of the customers are UK, Germany, France. Uh, I don't know what this EIRE is and Spain. Okay, cool. And we can also print the bottom five. Okay. Everyone done with, up to this point, guys? Any question anyone is having here? Hardeep. Yeah. Had you converted this description column into integer type? Uh, no, no, we didn't do any of that sort. Actually, uh, I also didn't convert, but uh, I am getting problem when I was using group by okay. on description. Okay. It's saying method object not susceptible and uh, it's method object we can't uh, use. Uh, no, it should not give you because if you do a group by on description, you'll yeah. also have to pass a column on which you are doing the aggregation then. Are you passing that as well? Yeah. Mm. Not sure. I'll have to probably will have to look at it. Can you like, did you run this exact same code and it's giving you an error? Yeah, let me check. Uh, I was uh, running it. Yeah, let me check. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll just post this code piece in your chat box and you can just run it and check if it's giving you an error. Okay. 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 Cool. So now let's go ahead and uh, let's do some other things more. Okay. Now the next thing which we are doing is we are now doing some kind of a univariate analysis here. So everyone is aware of what is positively skewed and the negatively skewed data, right? And if you have a symmetric data, basically you have the mean median mode all equal to on the same spot. So what we have done next is we are now doing some kind of a univariate analysis here where I am now plotting the quantity column. Okay. So what do you think guys on an average, do people really order in bulk quantities? No, no. Right. So we also saw it from the description also. See, also remember guys, it's not always necessary to do a visual analysis here, right? You could have also taken DF dot quantity and also done just a dot describe on it as a series. Okay. And make it even look like, you know, this kind of a thing. So here also you might've understood that, okay, up to 75th percentile, uh, the people who are buying is, uh, not that great of a quantity. So of and you can also pass certain set of more values here. So you want description, including the deciles of 90, 95 and say 99 as well. So now here, uh, sorry, 0 0.9, 0 0.95 and 0 0.99. Mm, this should have given me. Comma, comma, so you're forwarding comma. Okay, I forgot the comma, okay. So you see at the 90th percentile, uh, 75, 75, 90, 95, this should have happened like this by default. Let me quickly just check I'm doing some error here. Okay. So this should be 0.75. Point 0.9, point 0.95, and point zero 0.09. Okay, so we can also get a description about the 75th value, the 90th value, 95th, and 99th. So you see, uh, more often than not, it's like the max which you get is 128. It's only the one percentile of your customers which has really ordered a bulk amount. Okay, now if I do a logarithmic transformation on the same graph, this is what I get. 
Okay. So what, what is the advantage of using the log on this kind of a column guys? Any idea? What will log do for this kind of a transformation? And why do you think log actually can make sense here? So what is log done here? So the advantage of log is, what is the biggest advantage of log? Log transformation. Normalizes our data. No, it basically shrinks our data, right? It shrinks the range of the data. Now think of like this, log of one is zero. Log of 10 is one. Log of hundred is two. And log of thousand is three. So the rate at which the logarithmic scale grows, okay, it grows very, very slowly. This, this is the log scale, right? This is the log scale. So what happens is basically when you have this kind of a data, it shrinks your data. It shrinks the range uh, when you have this kind of a logarithmic transformation. It's particularly very useful, say when you have this kind of a outlier here, Okay. So what will happen is after a while, it will really shrink. That means after say pro pro probably maybe 12th value or uh, 10 value, the growth, if you have from 10 to 20, 20 to hundred or even hundred to 8,000 would grow very, very slow, which we really don't care. The only range that we care is this range where it has actually grown here. Right? So it's up to this particular range where we really value the growth. Otherwise, after a while, it really does not make a difference whether your value is small or large. So this is a place which is actually a good point where, you know, you can even look at the logarithmic scale here. So log scale, if you go to C. Yeah, this is how your log scale goes. So the blue line is a log guy. So look at this up to the point of 10 values, it grows and then it kinds of tapers off, right? So log function, I knew it, it would do something like this. <laughs> okay. Clear guys. So we have done the logarithmic of the scale and what basically this meant is all the large values have kind of like really nullified their impact we get like a transformation curve like this okay now i think your unique uh your quantity values mm, so from a unique standpoint of view it's having these kind of value variations but i really don't see like you know there was any need to do a dot unique on top of this here so maybe we can skip here okay now let's move ahead so the earlier bit which we did was quantity okay the logarithmic of the quantity and i guess this is also so repeated again so this is the code which gets repeated now let's have a look at the other guy which is unit price so we did look at the quantity guy we did look at the now the second thing is was there any other column so we have quantity unit price and that's it these are the only two columns right yeah so let's just move this guy these are the only two probably columns that we can look at so from a price perspective also hmm, there's very few values so the best way of looking at the price column would be say doing a dot describe. Okay. I can just copy these values from the top to see the actual descriptions variations. Yeah. So up to the 99th percentile, I think the max price, which has gone is 14.95, right? There's very few products which are really really expensive otherwise it's not that expensive to buy any product on this particular website here okay we do not have any value which is lower than zero and uh, yeah so do you think there is any value which is lower than zero 
is no value which is lower than zero okay so you could have also looked at the logarithmic guy for this and probably if i want to quickly draw it also and plot it so we can also do that so let's copy unit price here Mm. Cannot convert float infinity to integer. Oh, got it. One P. Because the minimum value is zero here. Hmm. So from this curve, we ended up getting this kind of a curve. Cool. Any questions, guys, here? Anyone has any questions? I hope everyone is following, guys, what we are doing here. Yeah? Could you tell again what is this 1P? In the yeah, basically, this 1P is to avoid the kind of an error that we had got. So, basically, what is log of 0? It's infinity. Yeah, it's infinity, right? So, what it will do is it will explicitly add one value to each of the data point. So that even if you have zero value, log of one will become zero automatically. So you will prevent that kind of uh, error to pop up. Okay, cool guys. So now what I'm going to do next is probably there are some more steps before we actually go towards a real meet. And in the interest of time, what I'm going to do is probably I'll just quickly run some next step of uh, steps here okay so i think because the next few steps are something that probably we might have also covered in some of the past few weeks so i'm assuming that you know you might be a little aware of it and can if not you can just like you know probably uh, have a better understanding out of, of it later as well so the first thing which we're doing is we want to extract from the invoice date that which was the date time stamp on which a particular transaction has happened so the reason what we're going to do is firstly convert the column invoice date into a date time kind of a format. And from there, extract the day name, the particular day on which the invoice was generated, the particular year, month number, day number, hour number, and the minute of which the particular invoice was generated. And once I ended up doing something like that, I can see my head of the data here okay so the day column that we had extracted from the day name was particularly the day of the week and this day number i think it's coming from the day of the month okay so month has we know the number of months that we have uh, and we extracted the year month in the particular month on which particular day we got the hour and the minute, and this is particularly the day of the week, which you can think of. Okay. So this is what we got. Now, how do you feel guys? What information is this kind of a data going to add? Why do you think this kind of a data makes any sense? Uh, where do you think this will add value to know that which particular year, which particular month, a particular customer transacts, how is that information can be useful? Understand customer behavior, like uh, do our customer like are available online on night or in daytime? Mm -hmm. uh, which months? Yeah, seasonal sales as nice. Srinivasan said. So is there a seasonality occurring during the daytime, during the week? So do you see some kind of a pattern which exists on a Thursday night or a Friday night, just before the weekend and across the different seasons also, which are across the months as well. So say, for example, if you are a particular cohort, which only transacts on Friday nights, maybe I can run some kind of a, uh, marketing, uh, coupon kind of a strategy on that particular timestamp itself, because I see like, you know, if most of the guys are actually making a purchase on a particular date timestamp, uh, that is a most uh, useful kind of a time for me to go and uh, get uh, 
you know we we can actually go and target them now i can introduce a new column which is called as total amount which is nothing but the multiplication of the two items that i have quantity and the unit price i have the month name in which particular month the particular transaction occurred and the rest of the few other things are nothing but some kind of descriptions here so i'm just going to skip a little bit here uh, i see the total amount okay so the same thing total amount is plotted so you again you see from a from a cart perspective your transactions mota mota can extend probably up to if i have to copy that bit also here okay so let me go and just quickly copy from the top if we are to include the most up other percentile values as well yeah so the max which i think you see it's 67 that it goes by okay cool so the next thing which i'm doing is i'm looking at on what particular day do we get more transactions happening so it seems like thursday is wednesday is are the days where people usually are transacting on the platform and surprisingly your friday is the least of them so not sure what kind of a uh, uh you know this kind of a website it might be where the sales you see are the least on fridays and thursday wednesday is monday is also a little higher than sundays and fridays but this is what it is so can go and plot it and we can even go and have a visual plot of the same cool so most of the customers are making a purchase on thursday wednesday is and tuesdays from a month perspective again so from a month perspective it's basically the november month which is actually the most seasonal so i think november october december no surprises here because a lot of festivals across europe and uh are majorly across towards the end of the year uh you know you starting with thanksgiving then i think halloween also comes in the month of october right yeah uh yeah which is nothing but the indian version of shrad so they have halloween they have thanksgiving i guess somewhere in november or december and that's where the new year and the christmas also kind of things happen what of september why why do you think september might be a little peaky one any any guesses promotionals and sales yeah probably because of the october month itself right and then you have september any idea about may i think thanksgiving east. happens in east um, yeah may, something right? like that i think yeah you have uh, easter also happening in the month of may itself so these are uh, no no surprises at least from from a purchase perspective right cool from an r perspective let's see if there are anything that we see so most of your customers are making a purchase around 1 pm very few towards the late evening and very few towards the morning time so between like 11 to 3 is where most of the chunk of people are actually online on your particular website here fair enough okay so now look at this the next thing what we have doing is we are binning uh that's why most of the products are decorative maybe like you know people are uh, uh making a most of the purchases between 11 to 3 when they are most awake and something that you know it's, it's a decorative website so probably it might make sense a little with the behaviors as well so the next thing look at look at from a feature engineering perspective what they have done very very smart what they have done is uh, they have combined certain few rs into tags so what they have done is they have combined rs like 6 7 8 9 10 up to 11 they have called it as morning hours from 12 to 5 pm they have called it afternoon and otherwise they have all called it as evening okay so they create a new column called as time type apply to the r 
a function which we have just defined it here. So it takes a number and converts it into a particular band to which the particular time belongs to. So if I run this and I run this, well, I can also even go and plot it. Okay, so most of the customers have made purchases in the afternoon time. The least of the customers make purchase in the evening. And there are some customers who also go and make a purchase during the morning hours as well. Okay, cool. So moving ahead then. Okay, quickly check if you are all able to complete up to this point and then we'll go towards the very first model which is a little bit based on rule based which is something what, what is called as recency frequency and monetary value so let me give you like two more minutes just see if you are done with the steps up to this point and then we'll start with the rfm model so it's a very very simplistic tool to do uh, what is something called as rfm model very commonly used across marketing strategies so something which is called as recency, frequency, and monetary based value, very famously used across customer segmentation. So we'll, we'll have a look at here more in detail. I'll be just back in a minute, guys. We'll we'll be just back in a minute. Now, the next thing what we are going to do is build a recency frequency model for the customers. So I guess the other day we did some kind of understand the different, different clustering activities. So that's fine. But then even before this RFM is actually a very famous kind of tooling, which people still use when they want to do segmentation. So how does it go about is look at this now, based upon the transaction behavior of the different customers that you have. So based on the transaction behavior of the different customers that you have, you can divide for each customer. What is called as their recency value, their frequency value, and what is the monetary value that they generated based upon a particular time frame. That means say, for example, I have a customer one, I say that, uh, in the last one year, this guy came to me, uh, just like maybe two days ago in totality has purchased 180 times in totality from a monetary perspective has contributed 3000 rupees of say GMB. Okay. There's another customer too, who was last seen from a purchase perspective. 90 days ago, uh, in a year of one year right now has only made two purchases and he came, whenever he came, he bought 
a product of 10 rupees for me okay in totality across these two transactions there's a third customer who came to me 15 days ago uh is probably like you know on an average 10 times frequent and in totality has given me 200 rupees of gmv in the last one year so you see what i've done is i have created features for each of the customer with respect to how recently did they visit the platform in totality how many times have they made purchases so what is the frequency of purchase frequency of purchase within a particular time frame and within the same particular time frame also how much is the monetary value that they add okay so you have say the information like this now once you have the information about these kind of customers the next thing is you can translate these numbers into what we call it as some kind of a quantile scoring or quantile binning that means what what i'll do is i'll remove the raw numbers i'll remove the non numbers based on just the recency value the entire column i will bin into say three ranges okay i'll bin into three ranges here Now you must have heard about this one function in Python, which is called as PD dot Q cut, which is quantile cut. That means I want to bin my entire feature into three buckets. So what I'll do is a value say less than a particular X value will be all bucket number one, less than between X and Y is bucket number two and anyone above bucket number three is Y value is falling into bucket number three. So what I'll do is I'll give you scores. If you fall between the lowest bucket, you are score number one, score number two, score number three. I could have done three buckets. I could have done five buckets. I could have done seven buckets. That depends upon the person who is performing the analysis. So I'll do the similar thing for frequency also. And I'll do similar thing for monetary also. And now once I'm done with this, once I'm done with this, what this will now allow me for the same customers, I'll have customer one, I'll have the recency value, frequency value, monetary value, a number between one, two, and three based upon the actual value which this customer had shown. So this guy who had shown two days, I'm pretty sure two is going to fall into bucket number one, the lowest value. So he gets a score of one. From a frequency perspective, probably he gets a score of two. And from a monetary value perspective, he gets a score of one. So in totality, his score is 121. Similarly, there could be another customer two. He gets a top score. If you have three buckets, he also say gets the top from a frequency top from the monetary value. So he gets a score of three, three, three. So in totality, if you have three buckets here, three buckets here, three buckets here, you have a total of 27 such combinations which you can form 111 112 113 and 121 122 123 uh, then you have what like 131 132 133 so on and so forth you will have 27 combinations 27 different groups now from the picture perspective here you tell me which are the best customers which are the best customers for you what scoring pattern is the best customer scoring pattern for you? Three, three, three. Yeah. So the guys with three, 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 or even guys with three, three, two, maybe, or three, two, three, the guys above a particular number here, a particular number here, all of those guys are like the best customers for you. So this is how probably you can then, once you have the scores with you, divide then your customers into different, different buckets, and then accordingly target them. So this is basically plain vanilla RFM modeling that uh, people usually also do. Okay. So let's do the same thing here as well. So here, what we are doing is running with logistic regression. Sorry. Is this, uh, I mean, the binning after binning, we are assigning score to each variable, right? No, no. Score is basically just the bin scores. Yeah. So, the bins. Huh. I get 121. I get three, three, three. Uh, okay, so this is a, a score of the customer, right? One, two, one, three, correct. three, three. Correct. So 
is this kind of a model only possible with logistic regression i mean which are not black box models no 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 there there is no machine learning here this is plain looking at the distribution of the data checking for this particular column which quantile bucket you are following similarly do it for other column similarly doing for other column and just concatenating the scores together that's it okay it is a heuristic uh... very very heuristic very much rule based yeah there is no machine learning involved and once you got the final score also uh, because we know the ordering of the scores ranging from 111 to the best 333 after a particular value we'll just probably say that again depends upon the modeler he'll say that you know what any score now above uh, 223 is the best guys for me all these scores above so all these scores above would be what 3 231 2 332 so on and so forth like this guys right So all of these scores above uh, are like the best guys. Yeah. So yes, probably three means for a re- recency the most uh, recent value. So the lower this number of recency, the best is a customer for you. Higher the value of recency, the worst is a customer for you because recency if the number is high, that's a customer who is probably lost for you. Then the best customer would be one three three, right? Uh yeah yeah, I mean. Here I'm giving three value for the most recent customer, so probably while billing you can take a negative value of this, so that accordingly the minus one guy becomes the highest bucket, minus ninety, minus one eighty guys become the lowest bucket. You can do a negative value of the recency value. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got it. So once you have what we call it as these RFM scores. now the quantile which you want to choose the binning frequency the binning bins could be say typically 3 or 5 and then accordingly so if you have 3 you have three combinations for r three values for frequency three values for m so 3 into 3 into 3 will have a totality of 27 different combinations for you could take it even step ahead and even do it for 5 so you'll have 5 r 5 f 5 m values in totality making 125 values and then accordingly you can bin the values and get the final scores for the customers okay so generally speaking the higher the rfm score the more valuable the customer might be okay so now here let's try to get this firstly for each customer what is the recency value what is the frequency of transaction and what is the total monetary value that they have dealt with now how do you think you can get the recency value if you have a data set like this can you extract the recency value any idea what is how can you get the recency value which column can you get the recency column customer id and date so basically the invoice date right what i'll have to do is i'll have to keep some kind of a reference date for me say the date on which i'm doing this analysis and then take a date difference between when the invoice was generated right so here probably what we have done is uh, set the latest date as 2011 10th of december which was the last invoice date date plus 1 so the last invoice which you had got was of 9th of december so you take the next very day as the the date of reference which we call it as the latest date and then what you'll do you will subtract the latest date from whatever the customer id that you have the maximum of the date which it gets and extract the days out of it okay so that will become what we call it as a recency value for the customer basically what you're going to do is uh, one way to do is so you have a particular customer id the respective different different invoice dates what you're doing is for the customer id when you're doing group by you subtract the latest date from the mm, the maximum date of all the dates that you had and the difference between two you are calculating or converting into the number of days so that's one way of getting the what you call the recency value now look at this the frequency sir, yeah sir max days means max is basically if you can go and look at it so probably i'll show you so invoice date here na so if i do info here look at the column which i have in invoice date it's of the type date time stamp 
So once you have the time, which is in date time stamp, I have another value, which is in date time stamp. I can, if I do say for a particular customer, say for a customer, I'll just do like a group by group by of say customer ID. And for the invoice date, invoice date spelling i can do like a max so let's see basically it means that for this customer id uh 2011 first 18 was the latest transaction which the customer has done we can even confirm this let's confirm this so if i take df df dot customer id and make it equal to make it equal to one, two, one, two three, three, four, six, four, right? So let's see, you will get one row and the latest transaction, which you got was for this guy. Okay. Probably let's take some other guy, maybe one, two, eight, eight, zero. So one eighty two eight zero. Let's see there are multiple rows. Yeah. There are multiple rows here and look at this. So three, seven, nine, 52, then the other guy, okay, again, this is only one transaction here. Maybe let's take 182, 83, 182, 83. I'm just checking. Uh, do we have, so look at this. So this guy did on 6th of January. Then prior to this, there was also 12th of January. Yeah. So I think this was after, uh, so this date is after this date. And for the same guy, uh, 182, 83, this became then the latest entry for us, not this guy. Okay. So whenever you're doing a max on it from the invoices that you have, you are getting the maximum invoice date out of it. We can also do something like this. So if I do a dot invoice date dot unique for this particular customer, I'll get the respective transactions when the customer is done, you select the maximum out of it, which would turn out to be a value, which is, what is the value here? Yeah. This is the value which you will get, which is exactly what we have also got here. Okay. Is that clear? So I'll get the recency value calculated like this. For frequency, I'm just calculating the number of different invoice numbers that I have that can become the frequency column for me. Uh, so here invoice numbers, which I have, right? So invoice number, I'm just counting the number of invoices that I have as my frequency column, the length of uh, frequency column uh, X and total amount. I'm just doing the sum across uh, the total amount column here. Okay. So invoice numbers, I'm just taking the length of the invoice numbers that I have, that becomes my frequency. And for the amount column, I'm just taking the sum. So recency, frequency, and the monetary value. Now, once I'm done with this, I'll show you the data. So for each of the customer, I get their R value, F value, and the respective monetary value for me. Okay. You can even go and confirm this kind of a data set. So you can pick up, say a value like one, two, three, four, six, and you can even cross verify that how many, uh, is the recency value matching? How many times did he transact with you? So I guess the way we have transacted or utilize the value of frequency is the number of different products that he has bought across the all transactions because length of X of invoice number, where in a particular transaction, I could have done multiple invoices of the same value. So if I'm even buying different, different products, uh, I'm counting it right now as a frequency. Now, this kind of a data collection guys is a slightly flexible. Okay. You could have defined the way you want to have frequency calculated. You could have defined the way you want to calculate the recency value. You could have also defined the way you want to calculate the monetary value. So there is no hard and fast rule, but the way we are showing it to you here is the only way to calculate the RFM values. The idea overall here is to show that for a particular customer named one, two, three, four, six, he is someone who was last seen on the platform to make a purchase 325 days ago. 
he just came once to your platform and when he came he bought an item worth rupees 77000 rupees whatever that unit is he came with a with a total purchase of 77000 the other guy 12348 he was seen maybe 75 days ago uh comes like about maybe 31 times and has a total transaction done up to this date is something around of 1800 value look at this guy 212347 recently only came 2 days ago a uh, very frequent purchaser 182 that means what almost every 2 days he comes back to your platform and has a total purchase of 43 so you see this kind of a description for each of the customer is giving us enough information about with respect to how much do they come back or how recently did they come back how much do they transact and every like on an average uh, or in totality what is their uh, purchasing power demonstrates from the monetary perspective quickly check guys if anyone has any questions in this kind of a data frame that we have built any questions here everyone clear guys simple stuff can you i mean are these the top customers uh, what do you mean by top customers uh in top customer in recency top customer in frequency no 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 this is all the customers that i had and i have just cumulative cumulatively calculated their recency value frequency value and monetary value like i've collated the description of them probably on top of this you will now go and do your segmentation this is just information about each customer that i have had. okay why will i get an like i'm doing it on the entire data set right i have not done anywhere filtered any kind of a top customer or bottom customers here right yeah yeah so there's no top customer bottom customer here we have, we have taken all the customers that we have in the data set okay now let's move ahead so i have this data frame created with me i can check the description across recency so you see uh on an average 50 days is a difference gap between two purchases that people have uh mean value also being 92 so it's kind of skewed we can even go and plot this kind of a data for the recency thing and it turns out to be something like this so there is a huge set of customers who also come very frequently to you and st starts to taper off something like so very very right skewed kind of a data set which is fair you wouldn't have a large set of customers always like this there would be some kind of a distribution uh which is right skewed like this there are certain set of customers who are very frequent there are certain set of customers who are mid frequent and then there are some kind of a customers we call it as one timers also probably they just came to purchase with you one time and then they never look back so that's okay right from a frequency perspective we can also plot this data so i think you have like on an average 41 times people who have purchased with you uh and then there are some very very odd numbers also here which is 78000 which is like the their frequency of purchase is really really great okay so you have less of these customers most of the customers are like transacting with you like for maybe 41 instances very very highly skewed here in fact this kind of a data from a monetary perspective again like on an average you are billing people in totality this is like for one year total like around 600 plus and there is a very few set of customers who really gave you a bomb of a business okay so again very very skewed okay so now you start to see the power of this now once you have the data curated in this kind of a fashion which is a data frame right so what happens is you basically can can you you'll see that now what this allows you to do is actually segment your customers based upon these three values 
you will now go ahead and create you could have either done a k means on top of it however even before doing k means doing rfm scoring is actually a very very old technique and that's what exactly we are going to do so now what we are going to do is for each of my frequency recency and the monetary values that i have i'm going to divide into the quantile buckets like 0 0.25 0 0.5 and 0.7 75 so basically i'm saying that anyone who is below 0 0.25 you make it into bucket 1 uh, 0 0.25 to point uh, uh, 0.5 you make it into bucket 2 and uh, 0 0.25 and 0 0.75 make it into bucket 2 3 and anyone above 0 0.75 you make it into bucket 4 okay so i i guess we have done it into four buckets here so let's see if i do this kind of a thing so at 25th percentile for frequency i get 17 for 50th percentile i get 41 and 75th percentile i get 100 similarly you get for money and similarly you get for recency value as well okay so now what we're going to do is we are now scoring our respective values into numbers one two three and four okay so look at this if you belong to the bucket which is for recency if you belong into the bucket less than 25th quantile value that we have i'll be giving you a score uh, which is say number one because here what i'm saying is uh, if you are higher value you are probably uh you are probably into the higher bucket and if you have the lower value you are probably my lower customer so here i think the scoring which we have done is in a reverse way around if your value is between 111 you are the best customer for me and if the value is 333 you are the worst customer for me okay so let's see like how this kind of scoring also goes by so i'm going to give you the scores and after giving the scores, this is what the scoring looks like. So look at this. From a recency perspective, you are 3 to 5. From a monetary perspective, you are 77,000. And from a frequency perspective, also you are 1. So the score which you get is 441. It means if you would have got the highest score of 444, you're the worst customer for me. If you would have got the score of 111, you would have been the best customer for me. So here, basically, instead of going top to bottom, we have gone from bottom to top. Okay, so still does not make a difference because it's all about cutting the score at a particular value. Like whether you do it, take the top guys or the bottom guys, it really does not make uh, any difference. Okay, so for every customer now, based upon their recency, frequency, and monetary value, I got these scores. Okay, and now one way of doing this is you could concatenate these values and make the bucket as 441, 111, 333. Uh, 331, 221, and all. The other way is you can even add them. You can even add them. So now tell me one thing, guys. With this kind of a description, if a customer has value of 3 versus a customer has value of 12, you'll see each of the customer will get a score now between 3 to 12. And that will also allow us to segregate the customer basis, the score which you get. Because the customer who gets a value equal to 3, he's the best customer for you. And any customer who gets a value four is the worst customer for you, right? So the higher the score from an RFM perspective, the worse is the customer for you. The lower the score from an RFM perspective, the better is the customer for you. So what we have done here is we have added the customer scores. We have called it as group wise and even from a score wise perspective. And this is what you will get. So from a grouping perspective, I belong into the group four for one, the value is nothing but the addition of all these scores, I get it as nine. Okay. So this is probably what do I get as my RFM scoring here. Anyone has any questions here, guys? Yeah. Instead of using this kind of a functioning now, you could have easily used a function which I'm giving you, which is called as pd.qcut. You can actually check it out. Uh, you can just pass the series and you would have given this thing, you know, in a better way. And you can, you could have also given the quantiles of which you want to cut and all usage of pd.qcut would have been a better way 
of handling it rather than using the applying function. So look at the function that we did. So for the recency guy, we said that apply a function like R scoring, which accepts your argument as the recency column, uh, the quantiles which you have. So here you have the data frame passed. So in this particular data frame, uh, you are passing the respective quantile values D of P and within which uh, the respective value, if it's less than the quantile that we have, which is 0.25, you return me the value one. Otherwise, if it's less than 0.5, you return me value two. If it's less than 0.75, you return me value three. Otherwise you return me value four. Okay. So this is basically happening across the quantiles that we have generated and accordingly you have got your values back as one two three four Harpy, could you tell like uh, the argument that we added in apply uh here yeah. so you have added the recency column you have added the quantiles which we calculated here okay so what we are saying is so basically it's a dictionary of values so here, what we are saying is from the dictionary that we collected, okay. So the D was a dictionary for the quantiles. So from my quantiles ka dictionary, you take the recency value, which is the P value that we pass. Okay. So you get the recency values. Now for this guy, extract the key, which is 0.25 which gives you the value 17. Now, if your respective X, which is nothing but each of the series values, if it is less than this 17 value, you return value one. Otherwise you return value two. Otherwise you return value three. Okay. So the, Got it. yeah, the first argument is basically the apply the, the series value itself. And the, the next two arguments are the dictionary that we pass. So this is basically the dictionary. I should write the dictionary here. Okay. So this D here is basically all about dictionary. Again, the dictionary, the same dictionary that we have defined above. Within which you are extracting the recency values and within which from that also you are extracting the quantile value of 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, which are the respective key values that you have. Okay, so now let me go ahead now. So we did this scoring and voila, I think, you know, we are done here. So now what we're going to do next is, so let's see. Okay, um, we are checking in the recency and the mod so handle negative and zero value so as to handle infinite numbers during log transformations. So firstly, it's good time to actually go and even check from the RFM DF that we have created. What is the description or the range of the scores that we also generate? So let's have a look at the range of the scores that we generate. Okay. So the minimum score that we have got is three and the maximum score also that we have got is 12. Okay. So that is perfectly doing fine for me. And uh, yeah, so I think Everyone, everyone understood this uh, data frame, right? Any, any other question that you have here? Yeah. So now the next thing which we are doing is uh, basically we are trying to remove some kind of uh, zero values that we might have come across in recency, frequency, and the monetary guy. So we are only doing it for recency and frequency. Uh, sorry, recency and monetary. So probably we can also go and check if I do. RFM dot recency, there are some zero values and monetary. Also, there are some zero values. Now, basically the reason why we are doing is, is because we want to apply some kind of a logarithmic transformation on top of this. And once I'm even done with the logarithmic transformation, this is how my recency values would look like. So this is my recency value. This is frequency value only greater less than thousand. And this is my monetary value.
Yeah. So the idea here is that if required, you could have also gone ahead and done this logarithmic transformations, but really it's not required here. Okay. So just ignore this part. So this was all about your RFM scoring. And this was the respective description of the RFM scoring. Now you tell me guys, if you were the one who were building this kind of a scoring, what is the different quantiles at which you will cut for the RFM score? So look at this description. How do you think you can now segment the different set of customers? Any guesses here? Like we can cut uh, on the basis of uh, like uh, three to eight mm -hmm. and then eight to 10 can be one segment. So, so basically let's go very simple, right? You already have the value five sitting at 25th percentile value eight sitting at 50th percentile and 10 sitting at 75 and 12 sitting at the maximum use this values only at the respective thing. So anyone who is less than five becomes the best set of customers for you. So you can also do like a RFM DF here, do like RFM DF dot RFM score is less than or equal to five. We can see their value counts. So we can do their shape here. So these are some 1200 customers, which are really, really good customers for you, right? Because your scores are below five, including five value. You could have also checked So similarly, you will now go and do it less than eight, but greater than five. So you're including people like six, seven, eight, uh, you're including people nine and 10, and then anyone who is about 10, 11, 12, you're including into your fourth quantile. Now this was simply based upon, uh, the four quantiles or the distribution that I'm plotting. You could have broken the segment customers into respectively 10 deciles also. So three, four becomes one decile or three, four, five, six, seven, whatever the numbers that you have, each score can become a, a segment also guys for you. Okay. So another way of looking this thing would be you take this feature here or the data frame here and do a dot on the RFM score and do what? Check the value counts, value underscore counts. So for each of the score now, which is three, four, five, six, seven, eight, all the way till 12. This is what the description or the distribution of the different customers that you have is belonging to. Okay. So in totality, you have most of your customers sitting in slightly higher ranges. This is the meat guys for you. These are the meat probably guys for you. You should really keep them close to you, your business. And these are probably the lost customers. You really don't really can do anything much about it. You should do something about these guys, but you should definitely take about care about these guys because they are the ones who had the best scores from an RFM perspective also. So even without machine learning, this was one way by which you could have tackled the customer segmentation activity for yourself. Okay. Is this clear guys? Everyone clear? Yeah. Everyone clear with the way that we had done this RFM analysis here. It's very, very useful. And you won't believe that it's actually very frequently used in the industry. Also, uh, even before you go for machine learning, people still use it. Like even I have used it in my applications because this is very quickly to do. And more often than not, not it actually works. Like, you know, these kind of scorings, which you go to do based upon the quantile, uh, it really works. Like, you know, it, it, it actually, uh, works very well. So, I mean, k-means and all those things are, are great, but this kind of an analysis also really works very well. Okay. Now let's move towards the ML bit. And this is probably, I would want you to do is now from the same data set, which we have the RFM data. Okay. I think uh, we did some kind of logarithmic transformations on top of it. Okay. But you could have actually avoided the logarithmic transformations also, but that's fine. So now once we have done the logarithmic transformation, uh, let's try to apply a K means on top of it. Okay. And what we're going to do is we are applying the K means on uh, the transformed data that we have. 
And in addition to that, even before we apply the k-means, what we're going to do is we're going to take standard scaler so that we're going to scale the features. And between two to 15 is the number of clusters that we're going to build. So you're going to build the k-means cluster, uh, predict the clusters and also calculate the silhood scores. Okay. So that we can also probably look at the silhood scores here. So now can you, can you code this thing and tell me what exactly do you see here? So probably I'll also keep this thing on run here and let's see. We can also draw a graph for this thing. So we have on the x-axis, we have the range of customers, the range of K, and on the y-axis, we have the silhood scores where I am now storing silhood scores anywhere. Okay, so let me just make a class here or maybe sil score list here. So that I can just go and append the scores, whatever we get. So silhood score list dot append score. And let's just plot this guys also. So number of clusters, silhood scores, and silhood for optimal k. We can plot this guys. So let me just increase the curve plt dot figure six size equal to let's make it 15 comma five. Hmm. So now you tell me guys from the silhood scores that we got, everyone built the silhood scores. Uh, let me know guys, if you guys are facing any issue. So look at this from my earlier data frame, whatever I had built, this is where we were. Yeah, so we did some logarithmic transformations. It was not even required, but okay, fine. Let's let's keep the logarithmic transformations here. Now the features which I have taken is only the recency and the monetary guy. Uh, I store it as a different data frame. I do the pre-processing on this different data frame using standard scalar. And then for this data frame, which I get, I am now fitting the respective k-means cluster being ranging from two to 50. Okay. Now there was no literal reason for me to only pick these two guys. You could have also picked up frequency also. Uh, so there is no stopping that you, you really had to drop frequency. You could have also built frequency and included the frequency as well. In fact, you should include frequency as well and do your clustering on top of it. Now, once you get and do your K means from a silhood scores, this is what the description of the silhood scores you get. Uh, I hope guys, everyone remembers the literature of silhood scores, right? What was the silhood scores doing? Which is, what is the range of silhood score? Can anyone quickly remember me? Uh, remind me what is the silhood score of the range? So silhood score range. One to minus one. Yeah. So basically minus minus one, one to one. one. Correct. If you are minus one, then how good or bad you are. And if you are positive one, how good or bad you are. Minus one is the worst possible. Yeah. Minus one is it's zero. And one is the very good. Basically it's saying that, Hey, me as a data point, how far I am from other data points in my similar cluster and how me as a data point, I'm different far from the nearest centroid of the other cluster. Right? So if you remember that score, uh, some max of in the denominator, BI minus AI. Uh, sorry, a, comma AI. And then in the numerator, you have BI minus AI, right? You get the score, which is your silhood score like this. Now this is for one data point. Take it across all the data points. Take the average silhood is where we have got this average silhood score, right? Do you remember guys, this entire calculation and the significance of the silhood score? So now once you have that from the graph here, what do you think could be the optimal number of clusters? Any guesses? Five. Uh, 
uh five okay someone is suggesting five the so, silhu score should be higher two two i mean okay of course two makes sense but what about four guys four four yes sir that's what i'm trying to say four actually makes a good sense here so probably from the graph of course two will two makes a lot of sense but then you know four is actually making a lot of sense here in this case so theek hai let's see let's probably do the same thing using the same columns but this time applying and checking the wss method also so from the wss that we get so from the inertia let's look at the wss guys and see what they are suggesting so i'm printing this guy and this guy is suggesting me this kind of a curve so from this kind of a curve what do you conclude how many good clusters you can see here two i mean of course two looks good but then is two the right answer i mean two I think like two lower of values actually uh, not sure if they are the good guys probably four again or five also is suggesting or maybe six also in this case because see compare this graph and this graph you know so you'll have to keep two or three scores like this probably for making some kind of a decision again i repeat my statements again there is no right or wrong answer here guys anyone who is choosing two cannot say that i am wrong compared to person choosing five till the time they have a good understanding of the business domain that they are also working where they have a proper justification of the number of customers or sorry the number of segments that they are choosing as four or two or five uh, you are in good shape okay so please please don't be uh, please be aware that there is nothing like a right or a wrong answer here now so say for example if i would have gone and built the two clusters so i go and build the two clusters and if i have to say just plot these two clusters this is what it looks like okay so i am plotting the centroids of the two guys on my x axis i guess i am plotting recency values and on the y axis i am plotting the monetary values here okay now does this kind of a clustering look good to you not at all no Mm, difficult to comment actually. Uh, so, given the structure of the data set here, doesn't look like the clustering probably might have been doing a good job here as well. Okay, so if it's a tough job because I think in totality also, if you just take the data sets here and say if I have to just plot them here, so say for example, let's plot the scatter here. originally data on the original data set also so i have the rfm guy on the x axis which is my recency log and i have the same rfm guy on the y axis Which is the monetary log? Let's see if I print this. Yeah, this is what the data set description that you get. Now I'm not really sure if key means would have really helped you here. Do you think there's? Do you see some distinct clusters here? Difficult to comment, right? So, literally very difficult to comment about the. the key means would have done really any good job or bad job here right so that's what is happening here i don't think so this kind of a clustering is uh, probably really has helped us okay so now in this case what we are going to do is let's go and apply another algorithm here which we call it as db scan okay now the way db scan works right now is think of like this it takes a value which is say some kind of a hyperparameter called as epsilon and this eps value which it's which it's using think of it as some kind of a distance to be calculated with certain number of minimum samples that it has it in, in its neighborhood 
it's a very neighborhood kind of a algorithm which it tries to build and uh, if we go and build that kind of a db scan algorithm here look at this i would say db scan is actually doing good because if you go to see what it has done is it has considered all of these data points as one cluster and all of these guys as your outliers which is another set of clusters so you see one of the first advantage of db scan is i do not provide a minimum required number of clusters that i need to go and build i only need to say that hey basically it's a distance based kind of a clustering so density based uh, some some uh, spatial uh, i forgot the can full form here wait uh, density based uh, spatial something it is wait db scan so full form of db scan is uh, density based spatial clustering of applications with noise okay so here if you go to see even from the documentation perspective so this eps is basically trying to see the maximum distance between two samples and how much of the neighborhood that you want to consider which is basically coming from your minimum samples here okay so it tries to calculate some kind of a distance of every data point with the other data point and based on that it actually identifies then the data into three different categories what we call it as core outlier and uh, there's a third data point also so there are three different categories in which every data point will be classified into whether you are a core data point whether you are an outlier or whether you are say some kind of a media me medium or a middle uh, kind of a person okay and accordingly based on that you get your clustering like this done okay so probably this is what it has done from your db scan perspective okay so now if i would have applied the db scan again so let's look at this if there are anything else more apart from that no these are all repeated steps again mm. okay so these are all repeated steps again okay now what we have done is, so we saw from the recent CM monetary, probably we are not really getting good cust good guys. Okay. Now let's use frequency and monetary. Okay. So we used earlier recency and frequency. Now, now let's go and use frequency and monetary. So let's quickly even go and see the, the actual code. So if I have to go frequency log, This is how your data is distributed. Do you see any number of clusters here, guys? Is there any distinction between the entire data points? Yeah, not really good. So you see how your machine learning is falling flat right now. Probably in this case, with the two-two feature that we are trying to do clustering on is actually not going to really work because there's no distinct clusters itself from the data that we have so if we were to actually go and do sil hit scores and elbow method uh say from the elbow scores let this thing ping fresh here yeah so again we get an elbow score like this and say if we were to build two clusters and if we actually go and print these two clusters i get a distribution like this honestly it does not look that great so i would really not comment whether this kind of a clustering given the data structure which is distributed like this has actually done a good job let's see if db scan can really do any different so if i apply db scan DB scan clearly identifies this entire set of data points as this one, except for some of these outliers and some of these points, which is identifying as a another set of clusters. Apart from that, it's actually doing a good job over and above what you guys uh, might have seen in the key means uh, clustering part at least. Okay, so this guy basically is doing a better job in my opinion because there's actually no clusters, and that's what it's doing. It's majorly throwing you only one cluster. Uh, which exactly the data distribution is also showing about. 
so cool that you know now if i have to compare the two guys so recency frequency uh, recency monetary and frequency monetary this is what the distributions were looking like and uh, the plot of the two probably looks like the same let's actually have a 3d plot of now considering all the cluster all the data points here which is recency frequency and the monetary guys so if i have to build a re the 3d plot here hmm. this is a 3d plot of recency frequency and monetary do you now see any kind of clusters here do you start to see any kind of clusters here now visually probably doesn't look like so let's do this let's go and apply the same things to now considering overall all the features so i've considered now all the three features standard scaled them and what i'm going to do is i am applying my key means getting my silhood scores okay and let's see the different silhood scores which i get okay so i'm now printing my key means from range 2 to 15 okay and parallelly what i'm going to also plot on the left hand side so this this long code which you see here right is actually getting the silhood scores for each of the samples also not really required okay so here if you go to see we are printing on the left hand side the different silhood scores for each of the data points in cluster 1 and cluster 0 and the dashed line which you see is the average silhood score for clusters equal to 2 so now this is what i get when i plot the data on a 2d curve okay and for plotting the data on the 2d curve uh, probably i'm just using the first two features which is in this case recency and the frequency guys okay so let me just quickly confirm if that's the only case here uh second plot showing the actual clusters form yeah so i'm just plotting the recency and the frequency guys only uh nothing apart from that so this is with the 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 to so for each of the cluster numbers that we have given we are now getting different different cluster scores okay but i'm not sure if each one of them has really done a good job so let's see if i would have just picked up two guys and again if i now pick my original recency and the frequency curve still it does not give me a good job here right so here again it has tried to color the same set of customers but probably again you won't make a lot of difference actually when you are plotting this thing in 2d is because uh, we have used three dimensions and we are trying to visualize in two dimensions here so probably this might not really be a good indicator what is going to really help you here is we should look at the silhood scores okay so silhood score is basically going to give you a better picture of how your clustering has performed and probably in this case because the data also is in 3d maybe you can also go ahead and plot the 3d guys okay so i am plotting now just the different uh, wss for the albo methods okay so again i'm using the same methodology 1 to 15 guys and my fitting on the x data which is now comprising of my recency frequency and monetary values yeah and here from the graph what do you think what is the optimal number of clusters which you can plot i think 6 and 7 mm. little tough to say probably 5 or 6 would have been like a good number so again you know it's the flatting actually is happening way deeper into the number but uh, i think probably you could have picked up 5 or 6 and we could have seen the clustering let's say for now if we picked up two clusters itself so we are done with the clustering and whatever labels that we get we are storing it back as a column number so you can add your cluster now 
back to the original data set that we have. Okay, guys, I hope you're able to follow the intuition behind the steps that we have done here. So how we started with using only two features to see probably if there are any distinct clusters. So we saw that it was really not working with two features. Uh, we then went ahead with three features and then from three features also, this is what the distribution that we got from the, the WSS guys. And majorly, if you go to see, right, the, the real power of this kind of a clustering is only going to come when now, once you have added the clusters, right? So you should take the clusters and get your cluster and do like a dot mean and compare the centroids. Now I want you, uh, sorry. Okay. I did a mistake. So group by cluster and do a dot mean. So now this is basically telling you what is the centroid for the first guy? What is the centroid for the second guy? Uh, what do you think guys? Do you see the distinction between the two? What is the first group of guys and who are the second group of guys? So how will you define the first group of guys with the second group of guys? The first group of guys buys every month, like a recency of 30 days. Uh -huh. And the second group of guys buys every six months. Correct. So basically these are the most frequent customers for you. And these are the least frequent customers for you. So now what we are going to do is let's change this to, let's make it five. And also then go ahead and do the centroid comparison. Now you get the centroid across these three features, something like this. Look at them very carefully and see whether you see distinction between the five clusters that you have got. Do each of the cluster is depicting a, a proper cluster in its own sense. Maybe four could have done a better job here. No, no, no. Watch very carefully. That's what I'm saying. Look at the clustering done, which is in, in my sense, five is actually the, the, it's a good number of clusters guys. Look at this guy. So you have one group of customers who have recently visited to you. They are almost buying on a daily level. And they have contributed around 8,600 as their monetary contribution. You have then another set of customers who probably have just visited like two weeks ago or three weeks ago. They're not as frequent as the earlier guy, but they are also not very infrequent. So their purchase is like around 40 days and they probably order in mid size. Now there is another guy, which is compared to this guy another guy, which is 60 days old. Okay. So now 60 days old, basically their last purchase, they are slightly more higher in frequency. However, their purchase behavior is spread across two, two months as compared to these guys. And they are even more valuable in terms of money than compared to the second guy. So they, no matter have recently purchased, they probably purchase fast, but their frequency of purchase is slow. They purchase slow, but their frequency purchase is faster. Like whenever they are purchasing, they are purchasing in higher quantity as compared to these guys who are purchasing very, very often, but in lower quantity. That's why you could see the difference in their monetary value. Also, the monetary value is very, very high versus the monetary value, which is not so that good. So probably the second cluster customer could be the wholesalers. Mm, could be, could be the second guy could be your wholesalers who are ordering with you in every two, two months as compared to these guys who are probably, probably could be your retail customers also. Now look at the zeroth cluster and the first cluster. What do you think is the difference here? So from a recency perspective, both are lost customers, but from a lost customer perspective, also compare their frequency and the monetary value. One guy really doesn't contribute much, but look at the other guy. They probably did contributed a lot of things. So they bought more of the products, bought 
more of the higher value, but less of the products, less of the monetary value also. So from a loss customer's perspective, both the customers groups are lost for me. But if I had to revive between the two, maybe I would have gone with the first cluster to begin with because of the purchasing power that they had. Okay. So the two clusters, even though showing the same decency value, however, they are very, very different from their number of purchases, which they did and the monetary value also, which they contributed. So five looks like a good number of clusters for me to go about. Okay. Yeah. Now the last thing which we have is from the dendrogram perspective. Now, probably what you can do is you can, you can take this up. Okay. So we'll just stop here right now. And the only bit which was remaining is you could have gone ahead and now applied even hierarchical clustering on top of this. So to your dendrogram, pass the linkages, say you have used ward and you get a ward dendrogram like this. Now, prima facie, uh, what do you think? What is the dendrogram suggesting here? How many clusters do you think can exist? So at what particular height would you like to cut? Probably at uh, between 40 and 20. Yeah, so maybe close to 40, maybe a line, something like this. I would have actually begin with, which would have given me one, two, three, four, and five. Again, this is also suggesting me some kind of a five clustering kind of a technique. And you can also get like, you know, uh, so you could have done like five clusters here and maybe then go ahead and even visualize those five customers, which you get it. Okay. But again, it's not really going to make a lot of sense to visualize in 2d frames is because of the fact that, uh, you are trying to visualize a 3d graph into a 2d frame. So there could be a lot of overlap, uh, when you do this kind of, a uh, visualization also, that's where I think probably the other techniques that you have learned something, which is called as PCA and something which is called as TSNE, right? Have you all heard of TSNE guys? TSNE? I think you have learned in this week itself, right? PCA and TSNE? I think you've heard of TSNE, but not learned. Okay. Did you learn PCA in this week? Yeah. Yeah. So just like how PCA is nothing but linear uh, transformation of your covariance matrix. So it's a tre linear transformation. Okay. Or we can say linear, uh, uh, what do you call dimensionality reduction technique. TSNE is another way of doing it, but it's a non-linear technique. Again, it does dimensionality reduction. My suggestion would be once you have built these clusters, right? Build a 2d graph using a TSNE here, and then try to visualize whether you are able to separate the clusters after you have transformed on a TSNE graph like this. Okay. Otherwise this would probably not give you a right picture. This would definitely be overlap because you're trying to visualize a 3d graph into a 2d graph. And there will be a, that's why a lot of overlap there. So suggestion would be either take up TSNE or P P PCA transform your data into a 2d graph then, and then plot those P uh, PCs and the T uh, TSNE uh, embeddings uh, in 2d dimension, and then probably check what kind of a separation you are getting. Okay. Cool. So this is all that I had guys, you know, I hope uh, you might have understood that machine learning always may not be the best solution to your problems. How many of you think this RMS RFM score also that we calculated would have actually done a very good job in this case. How many of you really believe this thing right now? You know, this RFM scoring calculation, which we did by just calculating the quantiles on the respective features that we have is actually a very, very good way of actually building and binning your customers into respective buckets. Yeah. So do not underestimate the power of rule-based systems also, but not always. This was a simple case, retail case, mein ye chal jata hai, but not always would be the case like this. Okay. So.
i hope you know you you guys got a flavor of this analysis here and if you have any questions i can take it otherwise uh, i'll meet you guys again probably in the future um i just wanted to ask like in pca we will just reduce the uh, like dimensions mm -hmm. and then plot it yeah yeah so you will do the pca transformation and you will then take so when you do the pca transformation you will get three pcs take the top two and plot them similarly okay. you take the top two and plot them for tsni also you can okay. do this yeah okay in that case guys uh, thank you so much for joining and uh, we'll meet again in the future guys thank you so much